checking Twitch. Grab my mute button. Testing audio. Perfect. Uh, let me go shut my AC off and then I'll be good. Okay. All right. And ready when you are. Okay, let me sit up. Oh. <clears throat> All right. Where are we going? Okay, 270. Okay. Ready? Okay. Okay, three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 270 of the Security Podcast here on the N30 Network. My name is Hayam. Tom is over there. Right here in his fortress of solitude that's going to have a bunch of bull, uh, holes put into it in the next couple of weeks where he will have to leave his fortress of solitude i have already left my fortress of solitude um anyway uh do you want any more into that or no it's uh it's getting it's getting kind of weird it's getting kind of weird i'll put it that way i mean i i, I want to say my favorite stories i went to costco last week where masks are optional. Like if you want it, why if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. The number of people I see with the mask worn incorrectly below their nose is like, what are you trying to do here? It's you I mean, you don't have to wear it. No one's gonna stop you. So why are you wearing it incorrectly? And still like, there's no brownie points there. I'm still so confused. How, like it's it's been a year and a half. Just about, right? Like people haven't figured out how to wear masks correctly still I mean, it's a, we don't know how to wash our hands either and it's been however many age i am this many years old and i still don't know how to wash my hands but it's look i i think it goes down to people complain about masks don't wear a mask all day i wear a mask all day and you you find a nice comfortable fitting mask and it doesn't really bother you um, I get it if you're home all day and then you have to go to the store, it's annoying because you're just going out, but I didn't, in, I don't want to call it investing. I mean, old Navy sold me really comfortable masks for like five bucks, like a five pack for like $5. So I don't know. I figured it out, but anyway, that was my story of the last week and we are venturing more out. So, well, let's start off. Our first story, I think we want to do the Colonial Pipeline. I mean, it is a little late. We spoke about it. But basically, the F we have two really good stories about the police doing good work. I mean, we normally don't talk about it, but the FBI, your three-letter agency, not the people that patrol the streets, but the real, I mean, the, the, cyber, the people combating cyber, did really good work. And we want to welcome that good work because I guess the key is you don't need to break encryption if you do, as Tom said, really good police work. So I, we just want to highlight these two stories. Yeah, we, we've uh, seen, like, uh, a while ago, right? Like, the same Bernardino shooter, the FBI was like, oh, Apple, we, we need backdoors ensure encryption. We need to get all this information. They've fought several times, thankfully unsuccessfully, uh, to try to weaken or put backdoors into encryption because, oh, there's a going dark problem and we're never going to be able to catch these cyber criminals. Uh, and it turns out that, nah, you, you can catch cyber criminals. You just got to put in the legwork. It's, you know, law enforcement isn't easy. No one said it was going to be. Um, taking shortcuts that make us all less safe isn't really the way to go about it. Uh, today, two stories that show exactly how you go about it. Uh, and frankly, it's kind of a breath of fresh air. I mean, in both of them, we real it's just people... It's the same thing we talk about. It's just the laziness or the inconvenience or whatever it is. Security is hard. 
and laziness is easy and both of those show that so the first one is uh the colonial pipeline hack we spoke about that the ransomware the basically the fbi recovered the large majority of it through good uh a lot of good police work so so there's a couple of little things to that story that I find funny. First, if you don't know, Bitcoin is traceable. This idea that it's anonymous is completely not true. Um, there are people who study the blockchain to the point that there's scripts and there you can follow the money really easily. So if somebody has your wallet, they can de-anonymize you fairly quickly. So if you're doing a lot of transactions, that's how it's going to be. Also, if you store your money on a U.S. exchange... That's not your money. <laughs> it's something, it, it belongs to the exchange. So the FBI can send something and say, let us see your logs and everyone has to comply. The hard part is if they took it off and they put it in cold storage, like they put it out the wall and put it in a safe deposit box, that would have been much better. But they didn't because they're using that to obviously run their enterprise. So the FBI found out where it was going, asked the server, I guess they turned it over. And they were able to, uh, what's it called, get a lot of the money back. Yeah, there's there's a couple different angles that we're working with to put together this story. One was that you know Darkside did report themselves. Uh, you know our assets were seized, uh, were seized, our servers were seized. They didn't name companies. They didn't name countries. But then the story comes out on Justice.gov where the FBI said, "Yeah, we had a warrant and we seized some systems." So you can kind of put two and two together here. And then uh, the FBI reports uh, we, we had the private key to the Bitcoin wallet. Uh, and if you're unaware of how Bitcoin works, there's a public key and a private key. And the public key is known to everybody. It's your wallet address, right? Uh, the private key is a thing you got to keep secret. That is literally the keys to the kingdom. Everything in that wallet is controlled by that one private key. You can think of it like a super big, long, randomly generated password. It's the easy way to think about a private key, but it works slightly differently. Uh, join our signal group if you would like to talk about the differences between symmetric and asymmetric encryption. Uh, but the feds had the private key. Uh, they asked for a warrant to go seize the funds, and uh, yeah, that's exactly what happened. They seized the funds. Well, that we don't know. How did they get the private key? So, exactly, that part's kind of nebulous in all these stories. Like, of course, uh, you know, the FBI doesn't want to say, oh, yeah, if you're going to do crimes, make sure not to do these things in this list, right? They, they don't want to give away all of their techniques, but they need to be somewhat transparent with the public. It's a hard line to walk. Um, but okay. what we're assuming, and, and, you know, to be clear, this is a guess, right? We, we are guessing right now. Um, I... I think that maybe Darkseid had their private key, like maybe the entire wallet file and private keys stored in the same infrastructure that the Fed seized. It really sounds, and other people on Twitter are kind of like going back and forth and trying to figure out, okay, how did the Feds get these keys? Did they store like passwords on the boxes that the Feds picked up? Like, What's going on here? So we don't really know, but it kind of sounds like, yeah, that was the case. It sounds like just security incompetence that uh, lost them all of their millions of dollars. And I just want to point out, we've spoken about Bitcoin exchanges getting hacked. The, the most famous one is obviously Mt. Gox. If you're putting your money, you're, you're storing your money on these exchanges. So let's, so let's ask you this. If I keep my money, my Bitcoin on Coinbase, Coinbase has my private key. Yep. Because they're doing the transaction. Exactly. So I guess they figured out what exchange it went into, and then they the, the, that's probably how they subpoenaed it. And if I'm it, sure if they, it went to an exchange, because it doesn't necessarily have to yeah. go to an exchange, right? They, they could have just had a wallet file sitting somewhere. Um, you know, I, I used to keep uh, all of my Bitcoin in paper wallets that would have stashed around in different places. Um, if, if they were using an exchange, if they were just depositing money into Coinbase or some other kind of online exchange that works with law enforcement, that would be hilarious and really tragic for them. Great for us, but really tragic for them. That's what I was saying, because most people don't understand that part of it. It doesn't have to go through an exchange. You don't... I mean... You can go through an exchange, and it holds it there, and, it, and again, it's pretty and everything else, but 
if the exchange gets compromised, there's nothing that can be done. And and I think people fail to do that. On the other hand, if you're going to be so cryptic and you're going to do the private key and everything else in cold storage and you forget your password, which I think has happened now more than the amount of money lost in the exchanges, you're going to have that problem as well. I yeah, mean, we it's... hear stories all the time. Somebody has to absorb the risk with, with Bitcoin. And, and literally, it's it's just a technological certainty. You cannot get away from this risk, right? If you're holding your private keys, if you're holding your wallet, well, I forgot the password. Great, the coins are gone, right? Unless you can brute force that out somehow. Or my hard drive died. That sucks. Your, your money literally vanished with that hard drive. Hopefully you have a backup. And when you sort in the exchange, right? Well, okay, we're going to assume that somebody like, you know, Coinbase has got lots of backups, lots of auditing, lots of protection, lots of red teaming, a bug bounty or two, right? We're assuming that they're going to do a good job, but there's always that chance that they could be insolvent. There's always that chance that the money they're showing you doesn't actually exist, and they're just making it look like it does, right? Mount Gox ran into that problem where they were clearly insolvent, but people didn't know until it was too late. So it's just kind of, you know, which risk do you want to absorb? And also, exchanges aren't banks. They're not federally insured. So when that money disappears, it's gone. I mean, I'm annoyed that I, inv I, I bought some Ethereum in uh, PayPal. And a lot of these companies, what they do is they give you IOUs. They just give you the amount of money. They don't actually own the the money until you sell it, where then they have to buy it and give it to you. It's just like a pointer to it. And that really annoyed me because I thought I'd be able to get it out and then move it to Coinbase, get my, uh, my promotion for using PayPal, and then move it over. But no, I find out after I buy it that it's just an IOU when you sell. Like they're borrowing your money now to make more, and then they'll give it to you later. And... And that's a really crappy way to do it. The good news is that, they, that, well, the good news for, I don't know, for somebody is that Bitcoin tanked 50%. And so now if uh, PayPal, I feel like PayPal, if, if I, it, like a reverse shorting, not a reverse, if I cashed it in on that loss, PayPal will have to deal with it. Like what I feel like they're trying to do is get your money now so they can buy, buy, buy more and then pay you out slowly. But now that it tanked and they, people are cashing out, I feel like they're getting ripped off. I don't know. Yeah, they, I'm just thinking out loud. But the, the other thing that, you know, is a benefit to platforms locking you in like that, is that the platforms lock you in like that, right? Why would you go to another exchange or own your own money or hold your own currency when we could do it for you? And by the way, you can't get it out, so don't even try. But the hackers can. The hackers can. The, ha the hackers can. I mean, I mean, look, PayPal is PayPal has been. I I don't know of too many pay, PayPal vulnerabilities. There's lots of phishing campaigns, but actual PayPal vulnerabilities, I don't, I don't, I don't know of any. Anyway, that's the first story. Basically, they follow the money. They they worked on the they 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 follow the money and they were able to solve this problem. And kudos to them. It's, I'm not happy. It's just no. good old fashioned police work. Like there's there's nothing there to it. It wasn't like super technical. They didn't have to build an encryption tracking cluster. They didn't have to pass laws that made signal illegal to use or, or any like kind of weirdness like that. They literally just followed the money and issued a couple warrants, seized a couple machines, and that was it. It's just good old fashioned police work. And I, I, there's another argument brewing on Twitter on the idea of should you pay the ransom? So if this happened to you, should you pay the ransom? And the people looking down upon the person losing their data is no, don't pay the ransom because by paying the ransom, you give these people air to continue doing this. If you don't pay the ransom, they don't make the money. And and I don't know how you're going to fall on this, but it's one of those things depends on the data. It's it, yes, obviously don't negotiate with terrorists so they stop doing it. The problem is that it's your data and you need it, and for whatever reason you're on the hook, so you end up just paying it. And that's and now we're hearing that insurance companies are going to stop. I guess that's good. Stop paying ransom. The problem is I don't know how they're going to insure this data. Like I don't know what they're going to do in order to stop this from. From continuing because it's not like it hits once and then you never get hit again you can get hit again it's not like you can't yeah. so i don't know yeah it i completely agree with you it depends on the data and it depends on how important that is to your business right like if if 
somebody stole your web server logs. Great. No one cares. The data's gone. We rotate those out every two weeks. Anyway, who cares, right? Literally no one. Um, but if it's something like, hey, we locked up all of your customer-facing databases and now your web services don't launch, like your company is at a standstill until you get this thing going. Like even if, even if you have backups, if it's going to take you a week and a half to restore and you're a week and a half without business or revenue... And then you have to like make it up to the customers who you've impacted because you weren't running. You know, is is it worth the cost? It, it might be, uh, and that's kind of where Colonial Pipeline was, right? They said, well, it's kind of worth it to pay to get us back on our feet so we can, you know, keep everything running. Um, so it it depends, right? It's it's a really unfortunate reality that yeah, when you pay that ransom basically ensuring that somebody else gets hit next it might even be you but the alternative is going out of business that's not good for anyone either it's again i think i think now it's the nations who harbor um these extortionists need to get some pressure on them they're not going to stop it all but we have to work on on stopping it. I the last point of this story that I found interesting is in this uh in this ransom they had they had a bitcoin tax. So what that means is if you don't know Monero is supposed to be much more private in this. The blockchain that Monero uses is I guess that's also encrypted. So I I don't know I don't I don't want to go into the details on how it is, but they said, "Oh, if you're going to pay us in bitcoin, you have to pay a three or four percent or five percent Bitcoin tax, basically to ensure we get the money and we take the risk of somebody trying to reverse engineer it. And I guess their insurance on that end wasn't that good because the FBI caught up, the FBI caught up with them. So I, I found that also really interesting. Again, to show that Bitcoin is not necessarily anonymous. Is it global? Yes, it's not anonymous. It's pseudonymous, kind of, sort of. Like everything's a wallet ID. It doesn't say like. Well, Tom paid this Bitcoin for this Steam game. Yeah. Uh, instead, it says it's... random wallet address paid this amount to this random wallet address. But if you know who controls the endpoints, yeah, you can work through that chain. I mean, I guess you can change your wallets every time. You can just <laughs> generate new wallets on the fly. Most, but again, that's a lot of work. Most Bitcoin software actually does that automatically for you. Oh. Uh, yeah. uh, if you, you know, if you know that, okay this person sent this money over here, it'll send the full amount and like deposit change somewhere else. And uh, like, there's, there's a couple different ways to obfuscate it. But essentially, yeah, with enough time, you can always follow that trail. It's a public ledger for a reason. You can look through it. It's, it's look, I, I think that Bitcoin has a future in the sense that it's a global currency without paper. I mean, but as the an uh, anonymity of it, I, I don't know. I think it just, that's what it is. It's just a global currency where I could be anywhere in the world and someone can take it and I don't need a piece of paper of money to get it or I don't have to go to an ATM. I can just give the person the code and be done with it. Yep. Okay, next story. And I think this is the better story of the two. So the FBI and uh, the Australian version of the F FBI, I want to say FSB, but it's not. Uh, I can't find it. I'll find it in a, in a second. But they work together and, and they created a secure phone that they gave to the bad guys on, tour, on, uh, on the dark web with a back door and they were able to track all their things. And I think, I think people are getting arrested or I don't know if it's, they're getting arrested yet, but the FBI has all this information, and I think this is this is just beauty. This is just amazing that that the FBI thought and did basically that. They said, "Let's get let's get a bunch of phones. Let's let's disguise ourselves. Let's put on the black web. Let's leave it dormant, but start collecting things. And when we have what we need, let's just go in." Yeah. So all of this uh, kind of hinged on one informant who had been distributing something called Phantom Secure before. Uh, on the dark web. Um, so the feds gave the informant uh, $120,000 travel and living expenses um, in exchange for, uh, uh, oh, and the opportunity, not in exchange for, and the opportunity uh, for reduced prison time. Um, of course, the informant is secret, hasn't been named or anything because, you know, they're co cooperating with law enforcement. 
Um, but they walked the feds through how these devices, you know, made their way onto the black market. So the feds said, cool, we can ship phones. Uh, and they built a bunch of these phones, thousands of their their own hacked up, uh, like encrypted, super secure smartphones that they then sold to criminals on the dark web. Um, and technologically speaking, how this thing worked is with asymmetric encryption, you can take a single message and attach a bunch of different public keys to it. So anyone with the private keys can read that message. This is how Signal works. Um, basically, you have a bunch of people in a chat room, everyone's public keys, uh, or when you send a message, it takes everybody's public keys in that room, encrypts that message with all of it, and then sends it out. So anybody with a corresponding private key can read it. So you have multiple different public or multiple different private keys that can unlock this. What the FBI did is in this super secure custom app, not only was it end-to-end -end encrypted between the two parties, FBI inserted their own key into the message so they could just decrypt everything that was coming in. Um, so I mean, th this is what we're afraid of with iMessage. Exactly. I mean, this is when we say we have to trust Apple, we we're, we're this is what we're talking about being afraid. Anything that happens through iCloud is one thing, but Apple can insert their public, their private key into every message or the FBI's private key, and they can have that. Uh, that's why these privacy focused things and what they do with national security letters and everything else becomes really important in their wording. And you want to make sure the corporate speak matches the we won't sell out your information unless we are required to. Or we'll fight and fight and fight. So this is also why those backdoor legislation uh, attempts are so dangerous. Is because something that is as trusted as Signal is today could come under fire from one of these laws that basically force Signal to add the Fed's keys to their messages. Um, so that's that's quite literally what the Feds did, but without any legislation because they just said, "Oh, look, the phone comes with this super secure app." You should use it. It's the th same thing you know and love. Um, and apparently they have arrested more than 500 people in two days uh, because people, these criminals were using this encrypted chat app and they weren't even trying to hide information because why do you hide anything in an end-to-end -end encrypted system? So they're like, oh yeah, the drugs will be delivered to this address by this van with this license plate. At this time, uh, you know, be there, be square. Uh, and the feds show up and they're like, oh, no, how did this happen? Uh, yeah, it's uh, honestly, this is really, really cool. The feds created hacked up versions of secure smartphones and sold it to criminals on the black market that they then used to bust the criminals and arrest them like this. This is beautiful police work. Uh, it, it really is. This is super impressive. I mean, this is what what we discussed that we should be scared of. I mean, it's it's this is basically a supply chain attack. They're not getting into the private business, but somebody's selling you and saying, "Here, look at the snake oil. This is super secure." And what I never understood is is Signal's not perfect. We 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 bash on Signal enough, but Signal is the gold standard, and yet people want to use anything else but Signal. And, I, and then we find out things like this, that they get caught or whatever it is. Signal has code review. They've been through audits. They've done all this. They've shown that they've cared. They've done some boneheaded business decisions. But I don't know how you take all that and say, well, I'm going to go to Telegram because Telegram has a shiny new coat of paint. And their encryption says nobody can break it and no one has broken it yet. And and we they rolled their own, but, but Signal is ugly. Or whatever else. I mean, I, under I understand the iMessage. You're an iMessage, you're a blue bubble. It's encrypted. It's good enough. But Apple still has the keys. So while you trust them, it's fine. But they'll probably have the keys. They will probably have an indefinite amount of, uh, of archival messages that maybe 30 years down the road, the FBI can get a key in there. And I think they'll have it. But I just see Signal as... This is it, and yeah, it's not the prettiest thing, but it wor it, it works much better than it did. And we know what they're about versus we don't know what what on what is this anom a n o m or a n zero m because they have to be special about that. So 
Like I, said, I think you said right. It's think, good police work. I think I, I have an answer to that that kind of predicament though, because honestly, it's something that I struggled with for a very long time, uh, especially when I was first starting to get into cybersecurity topics. It's all new and interesting and shiny, and you know, signal signals cool and all, and the tech is cool, but man, it's it's not the hottest thing on the block. Been around for a while, it's old hat. Everybody knows signal, right? What about this new thing? What is this new thing doing now? And oh, what is exploding messages in Keybase? What does this mean? And then you go to all these different systems because they're new, they're shiny, and it's it's the next dopamine hit. It's the next, what is the new shiny toy on the block that I can go play with for a few hours without thinking about the implications of what you're doing? Um, uh, frankly, when it comes to security, old, boring tech is in the vast majority of cases, way, way, way better than anything newfangled. Uh, and I, I know I'm going to sound like old man yelling at cloud right now, but frankly, boring technology has a whole lot of benefits in a whole lot of ways. Stability, security, predictability, I mean, the list goes on. I'm not saying that all new things are bad. It's just new things have to be pretty great to, to take the place of something that is old and has been working for a while. And I think that's kind of a healthy posture to take when it comes to security. Oh, well, and unfortunately it's signal is looks terrible. I mean, they could do so much more to do it. So people gravitate toward WhatsApp or telegram or wherever else. And like, but I still don't understand. We know this, the stories have covered it. It's if you want more secure, I don't know why you just wouldn't start downloading signal, see what it's like. And I think because it is, is that all the all your friends are on Telegram and it's good enough. We keep on talking about the good enough. Your threat model, the people you're afraid of are your neighbors, or as I say, ex girlfriend. It's they're gonna they're gonna get into you no matter they're not gonna get into you because they don't know what they're doing. And we, and you say, Well, I'm not really worried about state sponsored attacks, so who what do I really care? That's fine. But this is what happened when people didn't want to follow the rules. This this phone is secure. Maybe they had a signal sale, well, not a salesperson, but a security salesperson to say, this is what you need to buy. And they were really an informant. But again, that goes back to the human element. If you're going to commit crime, at least know what, I mean, know how everything works. I mean, you don't want to get caught. So I don't know. Yeah, it's you know, generally, uh, especially if you're coming at things from a security angle, pick the boring option. Pick the boring option that most people are going with because, honestly, there's usually a reason most people are going with it. I'm not saying that there's, like, an inherent wisdom of the crowds, right? We have seen large groups of people do very stupid things, uh, especially over the past year and a half or so. Um, but, you know, yeah, Signal is boring. I'm running FreeBSD servers. Pretty boring. They do what they say on the tin. But, you know... FreeBSD is super reliable and stable and boring for a reason. And Signal is really secure and just gets the job done and kind of boring for a reason. Look, if you want to go on WhatsApp and have your uh, your your meme posts, go go for it. It's fine. Nobody's gonna care. Okay. So what they associate your Facebook account with stupid memes. You're in your group of your friends and whatever else. But if you gotta talk business. It's it's okay to have another app. It's okay on your phone to have a folder with some of these. And I keep on going back. And I know Tom's not a fan of Threema, but I love Threema. And I wish it, people would pick it up. The problem is, is that it's paid, and it's paid, and it's out. It's it's free open. It's paid open source, where they need some money to maintain it, but they're not going to get enough because there's so many others. So that's the other thing. There's so many of these other secure ones. And for the most part, they're, they're, they've come back positive, but we should pick one. We have the opportunity to pick one to be the gold standard. Let's pick the right one and let's move on. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I think those are the two. We, these are our two articles that we have good police work on. I mean, again, like we said, the police did something a little outside the box and they figured it out. They didn't break encryption to do this. They didn't break the internet. They didn't. They didn't violate our our privacy. They didn't go after a, a random person. They didn't. I don't want to say they killed anybody in the street. I don't think they did. 
Uh, but they did get the, the criminals who were robbing money and doing bad things. And hopefully these people go to jail and they do their time. Yeah, so. it's, it's really great police work. No clipper chips involved. No, like weird press conferences where they yell at Apple for having the gall to encrypt their customers' data. Like, none of this stuff. They they just went out, did investigations, followed the money, paid some informants, arrested some bad guys. Like, it's it's as boring as that. It's great. And these it's fantastic. Are the, and the good part is, th- these are the smart bad guys. Maybe the moderately smart bad guys because they knew the dark web they knew what they had to do and they weren't the best ones that said hmm who is this random person giving me or dropping this in front of me or whatever else taking a fake hit and dropping their stuff so i don't know we're done that's it i'm programming note i'm not going to be here we're not going to have a show next week but the week after so i'll hopefully post this in the next day or two and then i go on vacation and then from there we'll 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 regroup soon So with that said, everyone, have a good night, and we'll see you in two weeks. Bye. Bye, everybody. Awesome. That went fast, and that was awesome. That was good. That was really good. Yep. I'm going to hit the button on Twitch and shut this thing down. And I'm yawning.